Good morning. Now, I'm coming late to you on Saturday morning, but it is still morning, officially. At least it is in the central time zone. Central daylight time, it's still morning. I had a late night last night. A lot of people had a late last night, but they were up early doing their thing. I tend to run out of gas. I used to be able to go, 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 but now I have to stay, 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 stay for a while. <laughs> <coughs> We had a great time at the Wheelerville Community Church. Had a good crowd. We ate splendidly. And uh, we <laughs> we feasted sumptuously uh, daily. <laughs> it's like the rich man. I mean, we, you would have thought we was rich the way we were putting it away last night. And we are rich in the Lord, believe me. We are rich in the Lord. I have no idea what our riches are. We can't even imagine what they are. Great is your reward in heaven, Jesus said. Now, uh, we had a good time. I got to bed late, but it uh, took me a little more time to recover this morning. I don't know why. I stayed in bed till after 8 o'clock, something I seldom do. You know, all my life, I got up around 5 or 5.30, sometimes 4.30, because I just it was time to get up. And that's happening less and less to me nowadays. Nowadays, it's more like six or seven or, or, or. <laughs> depends on how, depends on how late the night was and how heavy, uh, how heavy the, the time was. But we had a good time last night. And I want you to all know that I'm grateful for the people who came and, uh, and for the people who stayed, and for the people who will come next time, because I believe that old Trent's doing good work and a necessary work right there in Wheelerville. There's not much of a town there anymore, but there's still a community, and they like to get together. So the church is right there in the corner where D comes in from Crane on 248, and from Galena, that's on your way to Cashville. Good morning, Val, my old friend, my oldest friend. We went uh, all the way from kindergarten through uh, graduation together. And we're in First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm just going to back up a little bit and bring us up to where we are today, which we will be beginning in verse 11 today. But we'll go back to the first of chapter 2 and just uh, bring us up to date. I won't preach on it because I did that earlier. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before, we were shamefully entreated. And ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of our others, whom we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God, your witnesses, and God also how we holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Now, pick up today in verse 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Remember how Jesus said that a father should treat his children? 
what man, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a, a serpent? Or if he asks for bread, will give him a stone? You see, your Father in Heaven knows you need all these things, and He will treat you in such a way because He knows you need them, just like just like an earthly father. And the Psalms, the Proverbs says to train up a child in the way he should go, and he shall not depart from it. Much confusion about that verse. People say, well, he will not depart from you. That's not what the verse says. The verse says, he will not depart from it, the way and the nurture of the Lord. He will not come. He will not part from the way that you taught him, not from you. It is the way of the world for your children to depart and go live their own lives. <clears throat> for a man shall leave father and mother, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to leave home. Don't get scared when your kids leave home. That's what they're supposed to do. Also in the New Testament, in two connecting books, the letter to the, of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians and in Colossians. <clears throat> They're connected by the fact that Paul was in jail <clears throat> when he wrote that book, wrote both those books. But at the end of them both, it says that uh, in one it says, uh, children, be obedient to your parents, and the other says, parents or fathers provoke not your children to wrath. And uh, it says pretty much the same thing in Colossians. And what what that means is, yeah, children are supposed to obey your, obey your parents, but daddy, don't push them so hard that they hate you and run away from home. That's no good either. You know, it said that, uh, that you should not abuse them in this regard. You shouldn't demand of them things that they can't do. And just because your daddy made you do it, that doesn't mean you have to make your kid do it. There's some people just don't have the same aptitude as others. But in general, children obey your parents and fathers provoke <clears throat> not your children to wrath. Don't make it so hard on them that they hate you. There's a balance here. And that's essentially what Paul and the men with him did when they were in Thessalonica. They worked among them. They... They uh, didn't take any money from them. They, uh, they did their own work. They, they worked in the community. Paul was a tent maker. Maybe some of the other men helped him. Some, maybe some of the other men did other things. We don't know for sure exactly what they did, but they were all working, and they didn't depend on the church to support them. As we went into yesterday, God intends for you to pay your pastor. God intends for you as a church to support the work of the ministry, the ministry of the word and prayer and the things that a pastor is, is tasked with doing as he leads his flock. So you have to, you have to balance those things out. They were unblameable and they were good morning, Sheila and Stephen. Uh, so Paul and his men, they treated them like they would their children. They were kind to them. They didn't abuse them, but they told them what they needed to do. More importantly, they showed them. They demonstrated to the new converts how they needed to live in this life and in the next, you see, because the Christian is always has eternity in mind. What you do now matters in eternity, both here on this earth and in the next life. Because how you live your life here determines your rewards in heaven. How you live your life here impacts here. It impacts your children. It impacts the neighbors. It impacts the people that you work with. You can tell people anything, but no one's going to believe you till you show them. You can't require patience of people and then not be patient with those same people. You can't re require sacrifice of the church and not sacrifice also yourself and your family. 
A life of service is exactly that, Pastor. It's a life of service where you're serving them. They're not serving you. They're not there to make your car payment. They're not there to pay your rent. They're not there to put away for your retirement. They're there for you to shepherd, which means to lead and to guide and to teach them the word of God and to lift them up in prayer, to teach them how to live in this life. which I already said has consequences both here and in eternity. As you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. That you walk worthy of God, that you would walk worthy of God. How is your walk? Can others see Jesus in you like the song goes? I hope so. You know, we get, as Christians, we get blamed a lot for talking the talk and not walking the walk and not practicing what we preach. The reason people say that about us <clears throat> is because it's true. Too many of us are hypocrites. You know, you've heard the story. We say, I'm not going to go to that church. It's just full of hypocrites. I always say, hey, we're not full yet. There's always room for one more hypocrite. Come on and be with us that you would walk worthy of God. Now, in the theological sense, the only way we're worthy is because we're in Christ and he is God and walks with God. And through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God walks with us and in us. Jesus said that he would be both with us and in us. In the Upper Room Discourse in the book of the Gospel of John, that we would walk worthy. That's the only way we could be worthy. See, it doesn't matter how hard you have to follow God if you don't have Christ in your heart. It doesn't do you any good. You're going to hell. There's only one way to heaven. It's by the Lord Jesus Christ. The world says there's a lot of ways to go to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All roads except Jesus lead to hell. Only Jesus can get you into heaven. Only Jesus gives you eternal life. Only Jesus saves your soul. And not Jesus plus anything. Jesus alone. Always remember, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. You must be in Christ. You must be born again. That you walk worthy of God, who have called you into his kingdom and glory. You wouldn't be a Christian if God hadn't called you. Jesus says, no man can come unto me except my father draw him. And whoever the father draws, is Jesus said, I and said, any man cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. Because that person could not go to Jesus except God the Father draw that person to Jesus. It is all by grace. It is all by the will and the plan and the long-suffering of God, who is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory with cords of love he drew me love everlasting in the everlasting arms with cords of love I drew you before you were born, I knew you. I took your judgment on the cross, Jesus said. You won't ever be judged again for your sin. Did you know that? When you're born again, the judgment has come. Your iniquities were laid upon Christ on the cross of Calvary, and by his stripes you were healed. 
the disease of sin is no longer in your body. Do you still sin? Yes, because that old man is still there. You're still breathing. You're still in the flesh. But it has no power over you. You are able to say no. I counsel you to say no ahead of time. <laughs> it's hard to say no when you're in the front seat with somebody else's wife and it gets hot and steamy. Too late to say no then. You need to say no ahead of time. But you ain't going to do it. You're just not going to do it. Decide ahead of time. That's walking worthy. Decide ahead of time. I will not do that. Just like the guy that would not, uh, Sam I am, he would not eat green eggs and ham. I will not eat them on a plate. Whatever. I will not eat them if they skate. I don't remember all the rhymes. But he wasn't going to eat it. He had planned ahead of time he wasn't going to eat it. But gosh, in the end, he did, and he loved it. That's the way it is with sin. Sin is fun. If sin wasn't fun, nobody would want to do it. But it will never bring pleasure. It will send you to hell. And if you're saved and you sin, the Holy Ghost will make sure that you don't enjoy it and will beat you badly until you repent of your sin and come back to the cross. That's the Holy Ghost's job, said His job after we get saved, before we get saved, is to point us to Christ. After we get saved, it is to make us as much like Christ as he can before we die. And that is our only purpose in life, is to follow Christ. Everything else takes a second place to that. Family, children, Wives, jobs, husbands, uh, dreams, pursuits, everything takes a second place to Christ. I was an old man before I learned that. I had to lose a lot of stuff and suffer before I learned that. Because now I am completely invested in the one thing that nobody can take away from me. No one can stop me. No one can shut me down. They can kill me, and I'll still be doing the same thing in heaven, and maybe with greater effect with the seeds I planted while I was gone and watered. And God will see that I have a crop, whether I'm dead or alive, that will abound to fruit to my account and my rewards and redound to the glory of God in his glorious, beautiful Son, the Lord Jesus that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and his glory. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. The first, first way to know you're off base with God is when you quit giving thanks. You'll notice it when you go to eat and you don't thank him for your food. You'll notice it when you get up in the morning and you don't thank him for letting you live through another night and letting you wake up. You'll notice it when you go to bed at night and forget to thank him and for having gotten you through that day. Thanking God without ceasing. You need to practice it. We all do. I fall short in that category myself. I get busy with other things and I forget about it. Now I'll pray later. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, we're just men, but as in truth the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. When Paul and Silas and Timotheus, when they went back to the Thessalonians and established this church, we see here that the people, when they heard Paul preach, they understood that he wasn't just some guy. That he, he wasn't just somebody who came on the scene and started talking. And he wouldn't, it wasn't given an Amway presentation. He wasn't given a sales pitch. He wasn't giving somebody a pep talk or a TED talk. He was telling them the word of God. And they understood that it was the word of God. They understood that this word came 
from God through Paul to them. And he preached to them the Old Testament scriptures proving that Jesus is the Christ proving to them that Jesus is the Christ. And then, of course, by this time, Paul was getting revelations from God. The risen Christ had appeared to him. At some point, Paul had been taken up into the third heaven and seen things that it was illegal for him to know, much less talk about. I keep thinking about the place in Revelation where John hears the seven thunders and what the seven thunders had to say. So, see, we really got 28 judgments instead of 21. We have four sets of seven instead of the three sets that we study all the time because there were the seven thunders. And the angel told John not to write that down. Nobody's supposed to know that. So there are seven other judgments that are going to be a part of the wrath of God that we don't know about. I wish we knew about them. You know, if anybody asks you what we're in, the seven judgments, and you'd have to say, well, said, uh, said, nobody's going to know. And we're not going to tell you to let anybody know. You know, this whole book of Revelation, Jesus wanted everybody to know about it. It was written to the churches. Well, let's just look at this for a minute. In chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he cried seven thunders uttered their voices remember there were seven seven seals and in seven trumpets and in seven vials. Before the seven vials and the last of the trumpets, there were these seven thunders. We don't know what they are because verse 4 says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, pronounced their judgments. I was about to write, don't write it down, because Jesus told John to write down the things you see, the things that you saw, the things that were, the things that are, and the things that will be. He said, I want you to write everything down. And that's what Jesus told him to do at the first revelation. He said to write it in a book. He said to write it down. He said to write in chapter 1 verse 19 Jesus is telling John the risen Christ is telling John how do we know it's Christ because he says Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. In verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen. That's the past. The things which are things you're seeing now. And the things that shall be hereafter, the things that are going to come. Write it down. Write down everything you see. Well, John is getting ready to write because he's seen the seven thunders just like he saw the seven seals and six of the seven trumpets so far. And he says, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And Jesus told him to write everything down, but now I said, no, don't write that down. 
That's a secret. So we don't know what it is. And uh, <clears throat> and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Wouldn't hurt you to do that. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. That's the seventh trumpet. As he hath declared to his servant, the prophets. So you see, They had the word of God. Paul was already beginning to write some of it down. Part of the New Testament. We believe that either Galatians or this first letter to the Thessalonians was his first letter. But he'd already been in ministry and he's wanted to check on these churches when he splits up with Barnabas and leaves on a second journey with Silas. And then they pick up Timotheus uh, in Lystra. And and you see, he had to been writing to these churches because he was telling them that he was coming back. They may have been writing to him so he could answer some questions, which was certainly the case in First and Second Corinthians, and is now the case in First Thessalonians. But he was not only teaching them the word of God from the Old Testament, he was teaching them the new word of God that had come and was coming and was yet to come through him. And they believed that it wasn't just the word of men, but that it was the word of God. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You see, it's the word of God that saves you. <laughs> Nobody can get saved apart from the word of God, the man of God, and the spirit of God, or a woman of God. See, somebody's got to tell you about Jesus. You don't just automatically know. You say, well, nobody told me. I, I got it from a tract. Well, somebody wrote that tract. Somebody printed it. Somebody left it where you could find it. So there was a person involved and the word of God. You can't get saved without the testimony of the scriptures saying that Jesus, the only son of the only God there ever was or ever will be hung on a cross one afternoon for roughly six hours to pay for your sin and mine. He bled to death. He bought us out of hell. They put him in the grave dead on the third day. He walked out of the tomb. He's alive then. He's alive now. He's alive forevermore. And can and will save you if you ask him to. You have to believe. And the only way you can believe is to hear it from the word of God. You have to believe in order to be saved that Jesus suffered and died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul says this is the gospel wherein we stand and whereby we are saved. And it can't happen without the spirit of God. The spirit of God has to point you to the cross and make you understand that this word of God is true. And it's the Holy Ghost who makes you understand that. Then when you're saved, he comes to live and understand inside you and begins to teach you and help you to understand all things. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. And I've explained to you before, they rejected Jesus 
Uh, Jesus set them aside for a time. The kingdom is taken away from you and given to a nation that is bearing fruit. That was the birth of the church. A little bit later, that same spring, and uh, <clears throat> then the judgment came upon Jerusalem in 70 A.D., where not one stone was left upon another, and Silas killed 1.5 million Jews. Ty, not Silas, Ty, blah, 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 blah. Titus, the general, Roman general Titus, killed one and a half million Jews and took untold millions into captivity and spread them out through all the world in 70 AD. They were contrary to all men. In Thessalonica, it started out with the Jews persecuting them because they were thrown out of the synagogue. But then the Romans and the civil government began to persecute them. And that's, that's always the way of things. Your enemies get the government st stirred up against you so that they can, you know, bring you to phony trials and look in your tax records and find something you did wrong back 10 years ago. And if the statute is, the limitations is run out, they don't care. They'll just prosecute you anyway. They'll steal your property, steal your money, and put you in jail if they can. But they really don't care about doing any of those things. They just want to ruin you because you talked out of turn. My personal experience with this, I talk out of turn. And so I've, I've had death threats. I've had, had people. I always look at it this way. My back is wide. If you want to shoot me, you can't miss. You have ample opportunity to do so. I'm on the streets all the time. I will not temper my speech. I will not quit proclaiming Christ. I will not quit giving out the whole counsel of God. So if one day you don't see me on here anymore, you'll know what happened. That's one of the reasons I do the daily programs. You'll know that I'm not in jail yet. God bless you. May the God of all peace comfort you. And if you don't know Jesus, you need to come to him today. Not tomorrow. Today. We'll pick this up again. If not tomorrow, Monday. The Lord be with you.